Well, at this time, I invite you to open up the Word of God to the book of Genesis. We're going to be looking at various passages in the first three chapters. So if you want to get a head start, you can go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 1. Now, you know, when the message is all over and said and done with today, a half an hour later, I really do want you to remember what is said. (laughs) So I've made a decision I've decided to go ahead and sing my entire sermon. (laughs) No, no, you you do not want that. (laughs) Let's go with the original plan. I'm going to go ahead and share my sermon. But what helps is in the bulletin, there's some sermon notes. And it is challenging to remember what everything is said. So just encourage you to take down some notes in the course of today's message and really even more specifically, if there's anything that God really kind of puts a spotlight on, kind of really write that down. And after the message, spend some time with the Lord. God, why were you bringing that to my attention? How are you at work in my life? What is it that you're doing that you want to continue to do in my life? You know, there are certain names in the Bible, uh, historical figures that are more recognizable than others. For example, Moses, Abraham, King David, Uh, The apostles, such as James, John, Peter, and of course, the Son of God, Jesus. But then there are some more obscure names that aren't as recognizable, such as the man named Obed-Edom. Now, Obed-Edom, he was during the time of King David, and we know this because when David finally became king of Israel, he went to Judah, he went to get the Ark of the Covenant, and went to bring it back where he lived in the city of David. If you go ahead and take a look at the picture, here is a a picture of the Ark. The Ark was made of acacia wood, it was overlaid with, with gold inside out. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. You know, it's interesting, we know that there are two tablets that constituted the Ten Commandments. Some think that, well, on one tablet was five, and the other tablet there was the other five. Others believe that they were actually duplicates, that all ten were on one tablet, and the same ten were on the other tablet because it was God's covenant with his people. So in other words, one copy was for, for his people, and one was God's copy. And so this, this Ark of the Covenant, David, he brings 30,000 men. And it's this time of great celebration. I mean, he's now king. They're about to bring the Ark of the Covenant. And they go, this time of celebration. And then in the course of the journey, this, the, the Ark of the Covenant was placed on a new cart. It was being carried by oxen. One of the oxen stumbles, and a man named Uzzah reaches out to grab a hold of the Ark. But the only problem is that no one was to touch the ark. In fact, actually, in the book of Numbers, chapter 4, God's word clearly said that no one could touch the holy things or they would die. That's exactly what happened to Uzzah. I mean, really, the Levites, in the first place, were the only ones who were to transport the ark. And you can see the poles. It should never have been put on a cart, but rather it should have been carried by these poles. And when Uzzah died, David's immediate assessment was this. I certainly don't want the ark of the covenant coming to where I live. And instead, it got placed in the house of a man named Obed-Edom, and it was there for three months. Now, Obed-Edom was not a single man. He had a family. I mean, could you imagine coming home, and one day you see the Ark of the Covenant inside your house? Now, I remember as a boy growing up, there was one very memorable day when Dad brought home a tarantula. He found this tarantula at work, And he's like, oh, wow, this is incredible. And he put the tarantula in the jar, came home to the house, took out the tarantula, was holding the tarantula, let the tarantula walk down in the entrance of the house. And let's just say that I was standing way back and just kind of uh, admiring from afar this wonderful tarantula (laughs) because I really, like, didn't want to be anywhere near it. Now, I guess tarantulas aren't that 
uh, dangerous, and it's not very dangerous to hold in your hand a Howard Walker. But for me as a kid, it was like, wow, I'd say I just treated it really seriously. It was really, really careful what I did around that tarantula. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was holy, and it was to be treated with holiness and respect. And could you imagine? It's like, all right, family meeting. <laughs> The Ark of the Covenant is now inside our house. We're going to have to maybe uh, live a little bit uh, differently now. (laughs) But they treated it as holy because God was holy. And what's so neat is the scripture says this, that while it remained in the house of Obed-Edom, that the Lord blessed him and his entire household. It's a great study when you look at Obed-Edom you will count 20 times Obed-Edom is mentioned in Scripture. I mean, after God had blessed him in the Ark of the Covenant, then David kind of had to change of heart. He saw how God blessed obed Yeah, You know, on second thought, I think I will take the Ark of the Covenant with me. And even when that happens, later on, there's these mentions about these list of names and Obed-Edom. And this account of all these names and Obed-Edom. And then it talks about Obed-Edom's sons and how they have positions and how there's leaders and how God has significantly blessed Obed-Edom else because of how they treated the Ark of the Covenant, that they were responsible with, that they, they did what God said to do in regard to the holy things. I mean, could you imagine how our lives would be transformed. We say, you know what, God, I'm just going to take your word so seriously. God, what your word says, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to live. God, I'm going to take your word seriously. Imagine how, how different, how better your life would be after three months of really saying, okay, God, my life is just going to revolve around you and what you have said. Because God's way is not only what's right, it's always what's best as well. And how blessed would we experience our lives if we were to do that? You see, today's message is about being good stewards of God's creation. When God made the universe, in regard to this planet that we find ourselves living in, God basically says it is for us to take care of. You see, Merriam-Webster defines the word stewardship as this, the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Let me go ahead and read that one more time. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The big idea of today's message is this, stewarding God's creation is our responsibility. You see, just like the Ark of the Covenant was placed inside Obed-Edom's house, that all right, now this is your responsibility that God and this wonderful, beautiful creation that he has given and blessed us with is saying to us, it is now, this is yours to take care of. That stewarding creation is is our responsibility. And so number one, the main point, is God gave humans dominion over creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 28, it reads this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The word dominion means authority. God has put humans in charge and that they are to manage well all that God has made. And so here's the duties and the responsibility as a part of being human. And so, okay, well, is there an example? Is there a model that we could look to and how to do this well? And of course, it's God himself. We know about creation and how God deals with it, that God created the entire universe, and therefore all creation belongs to God. That God loves his creation. That God values his creation. 
God is concerned for his creation. God cares for his creation. God sustains his creation. Colossians, in referring to Jesus, that says that all things have been made by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. And that God redeems his creation, as Pastor James is going to address at the end of our sermon. But it's, it's more than just do it like God does. You see, the key is verse 26, that God made us in his image. In other words, when God made us, he made us with the ability to do the job that God would give us the responsibility of doing. You see, it's not like God made everything, and at the end, God's just kind of looking over all of it, being like, man, who, who am I going to get to take care of all this? It was part of God's design that when he made humanity, he made us with the ability to do it. You see, there's, there's something within us all that this issue of being responsible, that we, we know it's the right thing. We know it's, it's something we should be doing in all different areas of life, that we, we should be responsible. And the reason why we experience that is because that's how God made us. He made us to be responsible. And so if I had a fish, and it's in, it's in a, a, a bowl of water, or a fish tank, and you, if you've ever changed a fish tank, you know how it is. You try to transfer it from water to water, right? But sometimes those fish, man, they're, they're slippery, you know, and, and, and they, they, you know, they, they, they kind of squirmy. And so when you take a fish out of water in order to clean a tank or the bowl that it's in, if it kind of squirts out and just, you know, flies out, when it gets out of water, what happens? It starts flipping and flopping all around, right? Because it's out of its element. It's out of what God created it to be in. And so once you kind of put it in there, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now, now I'm at home. <laughs> now I'm, I'm experiencing the fulfillment of being a fish, <laughs> living and swimming and abiding in water. And you see, so often we kind of, exp- we, we, we stress, we emphasize the responsibility of being responsible. Well, you need to do that because you need to be responsible. But I think sometimes what we don't give as much of attention to is this, that when we are fulfilling our responsibilities, kind of the outcome or the byproduct of that, we ourselves experience fulfillment. And so, yeah, we want to be responsible, but it's not just about, well, do you need to be responsible? Be responsible. We need to also convey, hey, you know what? One of the blessings of being responsible is that you experience fulfillment in fulfilling the things that God has called us to do. You know, when you're, when you're a student and you have homework to do, you know, you, want, you, you don't want just to be responsible. Yeah, I need to do this. I need to turn it in. But there's great joy in doing that to do the best job you can do, to be the most responsible student you can. And when you turn that in, there's great joy and satisfaction. You, you experience fulfillment of a job well done. And when there's areas in our life where we know what we're falling short and we feel bad, well, we do feel that way because that's counter to how God created us to live and to function and to be. And so when we look about, you know, at work or at home or at church, You know, what are those responsibilities that God has given us to do? We want to be faithful, faithful stewards of creation, faithful stewards of all that God puts in our care to be responsible with. But I think sometimes we also need to remember that it's a process. Babies are not responsible. I mean, when when a, a child is born, how often do we hear, oh, that baby is so cute. That baby is so adorable. We never hear, oh my goodness, your baby is so responsible. (laughs) Look how he picks up after himself in the crib. Like, wow, whenever he gets something on, on her face, she just wipes it right away and then she throws it away. Responsibility is something that is learned. It's something that we all grow into. And so it's a process but then when there's areas of life where we're struggling with certain responsibilities, how good it is to know that there's others that we can call upon our lives to ask for help as well. 
Hey, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling in this area. I want to do a good job. I know that I'm supposed to be responsible with this. Hey, I'd really appreciate your help and support and encouragement. And how great it is that we could come together as, as fellow humans, even more specifically brothers and sisters in Christ, and help one another fulfill the various responsibilities that God has given us all to do. But sometimes it's not just a matter of struggling or growing, but it's a matter of being overcommitted. And that's why we're not able to successfully fulfill our responsibilities. And this leads us to point number two. The Lord God put the man in the garden to work it and keep it. You see, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 15, it reads this. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens, the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground, and the mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out to the Lord, uh, out to the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon and it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Dilium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon, and it is the one that flowed from the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And listen to this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Really, the key word here is it. To work it, to keep it, and this is referring to the Garden of Eden. So the man was put in the garden, and God says, this is what you are responsible for. This is what I have for you to do. Now, at this point, it's really not the whole earth. And we know that because leading up to this, it says that God blessed them. It said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so this was the area that they were to be responsible of. And as they had children, and their children had children, they had a, then all of a sudden the earth would be filled. And, and there's, there's a greater workforce, so to speak, to take care of this huge, expansive earth that we have. I think a question that all of us need to ask is this. Where has God put you? I mean, where we live, what we, what we do, our families. Where is it that God has put me? You see, you kind of have this image of, of, of Adam and here's Eve and they're in the garden. Let's say they say, you know what, this, this is what God's given me to do. And I'm going to experience uh, fulfillment as I'm fulfilling my responsibilities. But let's say Adam all of a sudden decides to take on other gardens and other areas and, and other stuff. Eventually, he's going to reach a point where he's not going to be responsible for what God has called him to do because he has overburdened him stuff with areas that are not his responsibility. And how often do we experience frustration and disappointment and remorse and regret. I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm not, should be, I'm not fulfilling my responsibilities when really it's not because we're, we're doing a bad job or maybe we even need other people's help. It's because we haven't really stay, taken back and, and asked that question, God, what, where have you put me? 
What is it that you've given me to do? Whenever we go beyond that, we're trying to take care of the whole earth. It's going to be more than we can do. So when we are where God has us be, we want to fulfill those responsibilities, I think, for two reasons. One is because of God's reputation. Some of the shows that you watch nowadays about restaurants where someone who is really good at restaurants, you know, he comes in, and normally the first part of the show is this. Things are in bad shape. <laughs> I mean, business is not good. Things aren't looking all that fantastic. And when the person goes into the kitchen, I mean, that's like, it's sometimes just disgusting. You know, I mean, it's just awful. He's like, he's got, like taking things off the wall and uncovering stuff and things are moving around. And it's like, oh my goodness. And the people who work there, they're the ones who are responsible for taking care of it. But ultimately, the one that it looks bad, or the one who it poorly reflects upon, is the owner. And so in all that we do, I mean, we want to be responsible because we want it to enhance God's reputation. We want it to bring glory to God. And all that we do, we want to have people look and say, wow, praise God for how, how, how fantastic this is being taken care of. But the other thing is also about being accountable to God as well. That God put Adam and Eve there in the garden that, that they would be held accountable for the job that they did. And so we want to be accountable. We, we want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant over the areas that I put under your care. And when we look at the place where we live or where we work and even the city that we live in, I mean, the one question to be asked in regard to stewarding creation as a whole is how are we doing? I mean, it's been many years since God has, has given this, this mandate, this charge to creation that we are to be stewards of it, that we are to manage it well. In various ways, various ways, we have done a commendable, honorable job in taking care of what God has made. But in many other ways, we must admit with regret and sadness that we have not been responsible stewards of God's creation. Let's watch this video.
that is heartbreaking when we look at God's creation and what we've done in just a few thousand years. Um, I want to revisit uh, our, our big idea before we, we go into uh, points three and, and four, just a, as way of reminder, because I think it's important, particularly with what we're going to be talking about next. Stewarding God's creation is our responsibility. Now, we were in Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, and I just want us to look at, at the end of Genesis chapter one, because I think this is important. Genesis chapter one, verse 31, so if you were, you're still there, you can just kind of be in between those two. And it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, we have to look at, like, the early creation, the early parts of Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God created a very, very good world. It was perfect, if you will. There was no earthquakes. There was no wildfires. There was no sickness or death. There was, like, animals didn't eat each other. Like, lions were still eating their vegetables as opposed to the gazelle. Like, you know, I, I don't know what it must have been like for that to happen because it literally was a very, very good world. Now, we get two chapters of a very, very good world. We get two chapters of everything being very good. We get the seventh day of God resting, and we get Adam and Eve just living in perfect harmony and community with God and each other. What a wonderful thing that must have been. But we know if you've been around church or you're raised in church, or even if you haven't been raised in church, you know what happens in Genesis chapter 3. You know that the very, very good world that God created became a very, very dysfunctional place. That two short chapters after everything that God had created it all goes in the garbage. So what happened? What happened to the good world that God created? Well, and this is main point number three. Man's sin put creation under a curse. Now, a lot of people will, will blame global warming or climate change on, on so much of the things that happen today. And I don't want to get into all the debate. You can probably, whether or not you believe in global warming or whether or not you don't, whether or not you believe in climate change or whether or not you don't, it doesn't matter at this point because the point I'm trying to make is that everything that goes wrong in the world today has less to do about the environment and how we treat it and more to do with the origin of it. And that is sin. Man's sin put creation under a curse. Now, the story goes something like this. God created the heavens and the earth, and they were very good. And then God created Adam from the dust of the earth, and it was good. And then God takes Adam, puts him to sleep, and creates Eve. And now it is very good, because woman is now in the earth. Woman is now man's companion and partner, and there is perfect communion in that. But they had one rule, one rule that they were to follow. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Now, one rule, and like toddlers, they can't keep from breaking that one rule. I was looking at my, um, my youngest yesterday. She was you know, she's 18 months old, and she was opening a cabinet because we haven't installed the safety latches. And I say, Skylar, close that cabinet. And she did. And then she smiled, and she opened it back up. Now, you could probably say the innocence of a child, but I saw in that smile probably the same problem that caused Eve and Adam to break that one commandment of God. Eve ate the fruit and gave some to her husband who was with her. Original sin came into the world. Everything that God had created was now imperfect. Now, before you start blaming Eve, I just want to make this clear. Every time I bring this up, I want to make this very clear. 
Eve was the first one to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, but the rest of the Bible and all of Jewish history and Christian history are united in one thing. It was not Eve's fault. It was Adam's fault, and Adam is always blamed with bringing sin into the world. Why? I I don't know. Maybe it was because he wasn't there to protect his wife from this snake who was speaking to her. Maybe he wasn't adequately telling her what it was that she was supposed to not do. Maybe he just shrugged his responsibility, but for whatever reason it is, God and the Bible always attribute original sin to Adam. So when creation is put under a curse, it is Adam that we see it's the result of his sin. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat it of all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Adam's sin brought a curse into the world. And you might ask this question, why did God curse the earth? The lion and the lamb didn't do anything wrong. The trees of the field didn't do anything wrong. The grass in your front yard didn't do anything wrong. Why did God curse the earth? Why did God curse creation? Well, I think it's very simple. Because the only thing worse than imperfect man living in an imperfect creation would be an imperfect man living in a perfect creation. Because if creation was perfect, why would man or woman ever need to call upon God? Why would man ever need to call upon God if the ground always produced enough food for everyone? If it always obeyed, in a sense, if there was never any problems with the wilds of nature, there would be no reason for man to call on God at all. So God cursed the earth and the creation so that man would be forced to struggle and in that struggle call upon God for grace and mercy and his helping hand. God cursed creation to actually cause suffering so that man, when he realized his weakness and his total inadequacy, would call out for help. Call out in agony and when God would hear the cries of man, and we hear it throughout scripture, when people humble themselves and call out to God for help, God always answers. But God wanted people to feel the the desperation of their predicament. God put creation under a curse but I want you to see something in this. In putting creation under a curse, God did not remove the responsibility to steward creation. You see, what Pastor Daniel talked about, how it is our responsibility to steward creation. Sin comes into the world and puts creation under a curse. God says, now, things are going to be a lot harder for you. Things are going to be a lot harder. You know what? It's going to be Pain you shall eat all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles will come forth when you try to plant corn and wheat. But it's still your responsibility. It's still your responsibility to steward this creation, even when it doesn't behave itself, even when there is tornadoes, even when there is hurricanes and earthquakes. Steward creation. Even though God put the earth under a curse, he did not remove man's responsibility and he did not remove our responsibility either. It was just going to be harder. And it is, even to this day, going to be harder. And nature actually will work against you, but still, you are responsible for creation. But even throughout history, 
rather than steward the creation, in a sense, we have continued to curse the earth through sinning against God and his creation. Now, one aspect of stewarding creation that I think oftentimes we neglect is actually for the good of the community, and that is taking care of the little plot of land that you have. I actually believe that it is your responsibility to make sure that your grass, particularly in your front yard, looks nice. Because if it doesn't, you then become an eyesore for the community. And people drive past and they see these manicured lawns, manicured lawns, and then they see your brown death. Keeping your grass cut is actually being a good neighbor. And believe it or not, taking care of your front yard is actually a gospel issue because we see that Christians should be better at this. Maybe not by cutting your grass and taking care of it, and they know you're a Christian, they actually think, wow, those Christians don't care about the community. You might think that's ridiculous, but hey, whatever we can do to remove any stigma against us. And this was actually true of Amanda and me at our last house in Livermore when we bought it. It was a fixer-upper dump, but it was what we could afford. And the inside of the house was falling apart. The kitchen cabinets were falling apart. They had tented it and forgot to sweep up the cockroaches. I mean, it was a mess. And we spent most of the time cleaning up the inside of the house, and by the time we sold it, it was a much nicer place. But the, one of the last things we did was draw our attention to the front yard. So after a while, we decided that we were going to redo the front yard. We tore it up, took out all of the weeds, and the, we got it ready. We tilled it. And thinking that we would save ourselves a little money, we didn't sod. We bought a big bag of grass seed and began throwing it out there. Not willy-nilly. We did it the way that the internet told us to. But as we were doing this, we thought, there's nothing. We've sprayed all the weeds. There's nothing on this yard that's going to produce anything but grass. Yeah. After a few weeks, things began shooting up, a little green thing here, there, and we started to feel really good about ourselves that we had brought forth grass because just as this said, cursed is the ground, we thought, oh, we have overcome that. And then after a few weeks, we had a full green front lawn of nothing but weeds. Creation was working against us. And so we decided we're not giving up. So we got some of that weed killer that you can spray on your lawn that kills the weeds and not the grass. We threw out new grass. But then, of course, thinking, okay, well, now after months, we had nothing but grass. And it was glorious and beautiful. And I think that I could say that it was very good. But it didn't stay that way. Because after a while of cutting it, we would find little patches of this cancer in corners of it. And we had to dig it up and plant more grass. You see, our lawns are sometimes things we expect to thrive on neglect. But before long, if we don't keep up on it, it will be nothing but weeds again. They keep sprouting up and taking over our lawn. We had to constantly keep stewarding this grass. Now, there's probably an illustration of how sin does this in our lives. But for this illustration, I just want to show you that even our lawns are under the curse of sin. It's going to be harder, but it's still our responsibility. The sin and the curse that has been brought into the world does not remove our responsibility to steward God's creation. It just makes it more difficult. More difficult to maintain your lawn. More difficult to make sure that the rainforests stay, that trees don't die. It makes it more difficult. But through the grace of God, when we call out to him, we press on. Now, many of us, we can look around and see that the world and creation is pretty messed up. The video that we just watched is heartbreaking. How can we possibly stem the tide of what we've already done? And yeah, there are things we can do, but I think there's some encouragement that we need right now, and that is point number four. God will restore creation in the end. 
The world is messed up. We have natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes. We have floodings, tsunamis. We have famines, natural disasters. And because of that, we have poverty because creation was meant to feed all of the world. But we have famine and we have hunger because creation has been cursed. And this is just compounded by the fact that there are almost, there are are many billions of people living on the earth. How can we respond? Well, we can take encouragement that this certainly wasn't the way things were supposed to be. Genesis 1 and 2 were the way things were supposed to be. You just throw seed and it just pops up with food to eat. But it's a lot harder now. God will, in the end, restore all of creation to the way that it was supposed to be. So in order for us to see this, I feel like we need to turn in our Bibles to the end. I love the end of the story because even skipping there is not cheating, but it is, shows us exactly what is going to happen. And it's Revelation chapter 21, and really we'll just read verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. In the end, God will restore creation. It will be immaculate and perfect just the way that it was in the beginning, in the way that it was supposed to be. When I think about this, I, I think about classic cars. I love classic cars. There's just something about those old cars that are made with chrome and steel and none of those pesky safety devices like airbags and shoulder shoulder seatbelts. There is beauty in the rumbling of 400 horses under the hood without all that emissions equipment clogging up the power. Maybe that's part of the problem related to the environment, but I digress. But most of these cars that were from the 60s and the 70s have rusted and fallen apart. So they need to be restored. If you find one and you see somebody selling a rust bucket with no floorboards and they're like, $18,000, please. But then you see somebody with the skills and the gifts to take that rust bucket and restore it. And when you see the before and after pictures and you see that what they started with and what they ended with, and you see the, res- the restoration of that car, it can take your breath away. And you see the beauty of this perfect paint, tires that have never smelled smoke from a burnout. It's good, and it's beautiful. But those two will one day, again, decay, rust, and fall apart. It will not be that way with the new heavens and the new earth. Because when God restores it once and for all, it will be perfect for all of eternity. Many of you have been fed the lie that you're going to get a halo and a little harp and you're going to be up in a cloud and it's going to be this this spiritual experience of heaven. No, our eternal place is in a restored heaven and earth with physical glorified bodies that will never age and never get sick. God will one day restore all things. Now you might ask the question, okay, if God's going to restore all of this and everything is going to be restored, why care about the earth that we have destroyed now? Well, I think it's very simple. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. You don't know when Jesus is coming back. You and I still have to live here And our kids and our grandkids still have to live here. So because of that, we should do all in our power to protect and steward what God has given us. Because remember, it is still our responsibility. God didn't say, don't care about this because one day I'm going to restore it. No, God said, this is your responsibility. Take care of creation. God will one day restore it all, but we still must take care of this now. God didn't renege our responsibility. It is just going to be harder. And yes, for us now, 
There is this part where we need to stem the tide of what we've already done to creation. We should do what we can to protect the environment so other generations can use it. We need to alleviate famine and hunger. We need to recognize that the world that we live in must produce enough food for everyone. And believe it or not, it does. But we throw most of it away. We need to alleviate hunger by not being so wasteful. We need to protect the air that we breathe because our children breathe it as well. We need to be good neighbors and take care of what God has given us. It's still our responsibility to make sure this earth is available to the next generation. We must do our part. So I want to ask you, what is your part? When we think about our response for this week, I want us to think through, this week I will steward creation by, and and what is it? And I want to make this clear because some people are like, why do we care about the environment? We should just care about making disciples like I talked about last week. Just share the gospel. Of course, that's what we should do. But stewarding God's creation is a gospel issue. Stewarding God's creation can actually bridge people to Jesus by showing that Christians actually care about others. Christians should care more about creation because we know what's at stake. We should be the first to jump in when things go awry. And believe it or not, we are. When tsunamis hit, Christians are some of the first on the ground serving those who are in need of help. When tornadoes hit, we're on the ground serving those regardless of whether or not they claim Christ because we recognize that by doing our part, we can lead other people to Jesus. We want to make sure that there's enough for everyone because sometimes the very things that get in the way of somebody coming to Jesus is not having enough to eat. The air that we breathe causes problems in our respiratory systems. By showing that we care about the environment, we care about God's creation, we acknowledge that it is God's creation. There's a song that we used to sing called, This is My Father's World. We ought to care about our Father's world. And there's two sides of this. And this one side, we're asking you individually, what will you do to steward God's creation? But there's another side of what will we as a church do to steward God's creation. We've made some decisions around here at North Hills that we'd like to share with you because we believe that we ought to steward God's creation. This past week, we made a decision as an organization that we are going to start recycling here at North Hills. We're going to establish a recycling program on campus that will be consistent. There are pockets here and there. I see some of you stack your your bottles and cans on top of trash cans, hoping that somebody will take them away, we're going to start comprehensively doing that. Recycling, so simple, but it's something that we can do. So we're going to get recycling bins or, or baskets to put beside trash cans to make sure that we have an opportunity to recycle. I know that sometimes you see the recycling bin right next to the trash can, and you're like, you still throw it in the trash can but we're going to try just as a step. Because remember, it's a process. And then over the next three months, we have decided as a church that we are going to plan and implement a community service project in our community in the next fiscal year. We hope to have 200 to 250 people serving from our entire organization on a single day serving in our community. We want all involved as we fact find on what exactly is the needs of our community. We'd like to ask you to give us suggestions of what you think might be a need in our community. You can give us suggestions on the communication cards and drop them in the offering plate. You can email the church office or you can meet with us in person. But I wanna warn you, if you make a suggestion We're expecting you to be a part of the solution because we want to practice what we preach. 
But please understand me. We don't want to just do things. Our primary goal in everything that we do, whether or not we plant trees or pick up trash or clean up a park, is we want to spread the name of Jesus with words from the city of Alejo to the ends of the earth. That is our number one responsibility. But if stewarding God's creation and loving our community helps us do that, then by all means, let us fulfill that first responsibility given to us back in the garden to Adam and Eve to steward his creation. And as we steward his creation, we share the name of Jesus who created it all. Pastor Daniel mentioned a, a, a verse in Colossians, and I, I want to read this as we, as we think about whose creation it is. Speaking of Jesus, the Apostle Paul writes, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. All of creation was created in Jesus and for Jesus. And it belongs to him. And we ought to take what is his and treat it with the same respect that we would treat the creator. This earth is his and he has entrusted it to us. Let us do our best to play the part that he has given us in taking care of his creation. Thank you for watching. We hope this message has encouraged you as you seek to love God, serve others, and change the world. Check us out on our website, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel in order to receive more updates and resources from North Hills. God bless.